built on water and mud, a creation of color and light. Venice is an unreal city whose thousand-year history hides many mysteries. One of them is the life of the composer of this music, Antonio Vivaldi. Like the masks so commonly worn by 18th century Venetians, the years have hidden from us most of the details of Vivaldi's life. He left no autobiography. There are few accounts of him by writers of his time. Within a few years of his death, he disappeared from history, the man and almost all of his music. For 200 years, Vivaldi's music was almost unknown. But since the early 1950s, it has known an astonishing renaissance. Antonio Vivaldi lived and worked in Venice during the first half of the 18th century amid the blaze of color and music that marked the sunset of the Republic. Great celebrations were part of life in the city. It's a tradition that continues today. Celebrations of various kinds continued during almost half the year. They drew visitors from all over Europe. Many of the greatest spectacles took place on the Grand Canal, the most elegant street in the world. Vivaldi wrote music for many of his city's great events, and his concerto for two trumpets was particularly suited to such an occasion. It's just over half a century since the greater part of Vivaldi's music was found. The rebirth of this red-haired priest who, we are told, played the violin like a devil, began with the rediscovery of another musical giant. Johann Sebastian Bach, who lived at the same time as Vivaldi, 
did not enjoy as great a popularity in his own lifetime as did Vivaldi, nor did he later suffer as complete an eclipse, but he too largely disappeared from the musical scene for a very long time. Almost a century after his death, Bach had been rediscovered and was honored far beyond anything he had known in his lifetime. Pieces such as this were found amongst his works. Bach had transcribed them for harpsichord from originals written for strings by a certain Antonio Vivaldi. unknown that the master had dignified by his adaptations. For a time, the works of the Venetian composer were considered of value only as adapted by Bach. It was not until early in this century that Vivaldi's originals were recognized as great works in their own right. Before the First World War, French musicologist Marc Pancherle did the first important research on the life and music of the obscure Venetian composer. But he had little to go on. In 1948, he published the first important book on Vivaldi. In many European archives, other scholars were searching for details of his life and music. And here, in the 1,000-year-old archives of Venice, Don Gastone Vio, has turned up, piece by piece, documents that are gradually answering some of the questions about Vivaldi's life. It's painstaking work. Only great persistence will turn up scraps of information, perhaps a name and address in a census, or an ancient lease signed by Antonio Vivaldi. March 4, 1678, Antonio Vivaldi was born in his parents' home, one of those facing onto this square in Venice. He was so weak that the midwife feared for his life and baptized him immediately. It was a weakness that would play a critical role in his life and career. Two months after his birth, Antonio was brought here to the church of San Giovanni in Bragora to be officially received. Three more sons and three daughters were later born to the Vivaldi family. Young Antonio's childhood was probably much like that of any other Venetian boy of the time. He is not known to have been a musical prodigy, but it's likely that he studied the violin with his father, a former barber who became one of the city's best violinists. Perhaps his uncertain health favored music rather than more vigorous pursuits. Though a diagnosis 300 years later is a risky venture, Vivaldi seems to have suffered throughout his life from a sort of asthma. Vivaldi was born at the center of the musical world. 
The city on the lagoon was bathed in music. There were concerts everywhere. Seven theaters were devoted solely to opera. In the churches, one heard the finest of new music by the best composers. All Venetians participated enthusiastically in this flood of music. In the streets, tradesmen often sang in complex harmony. The canals rang with music. Gondoliers often sang responses to each other over long distances. With so much music around him, and with a violinist father to teach him, young Antonio had ample incentive to make music himself. The city continued to grow in splendor during Vivaldi's youth. The church at Santa Maria della Salute was completed when Antonio was nine. It demonstrates the same extravagance that can be felt in music Vivaldi wrote later in life. When Antonio was four, Capesero was completed. In its opulence, it's reminiscent of an 18th century Venetian opera setting.
there was more than the magnificence of his surroundings to impress young Antonio. The spirit of everyday Venetian life, the hard work of ordinary people, the pasta, the wine, the clear, bright sun shining on water and stone. It can all be felt in the music Vivaldi was to write. In Vivaldi's music, we can sense the love songs that were part of Venetian life. Antonio's father was a violinist in the most prestigious orchestra of the city, that of the Doge's Chapel, the Basilica San Marco. age of 12, Antonio often played alongside his father in the great church. Venetian homes of every class, families made music. Some, like Albinoni, became renowned musicians while wishing to be known as amateurs. Scusa, quando faremo un'altra prova col maestro Legrenzi? Non so, prima dobbiamo andare a San Marco per parlarne col maestro. Ah. 
Oh, grazie Antonio. Perché adesso non suoni qualcosa per i nostri amici? Eh sì. Vuoi un altro bicchiere di vino? Sì, grazie. Undoubtedly, young Antonio was much influenced by his father and his musical friends. The music of such contemporary composers as Arcangelo Corelli would have been an important part of his life. Young Vivaldi's musical gifts were evident, but how could he best be assured a successful career in music? In a city run by noble families, just as it had been for centuries, the son of a barber turned violinist would have many social, political, and financial barriers to overcome. became a priest, he would be assured the respect of civil authority and the protection of the church. The priest's robes could open many doors for a young musician. Then there was Antonio's frail health to consider, the chest ailment that plagued him throughout his life. considered by Giovanni Battista Vivaldi as he sought a suitable path for the boy and decided that as a priest his son could best make a career in music. And so, at the age of 15, Antonio began to study for the priesthood. The Church of Vivaldi's time fostered great art and great music. The finest painters and sculptors were commissioned to create art for the churches, and musicians were expected to compose a steady flow of new works for masses and other religious ceremonies. Cum Sancto Spiritu was part of a great sacred work by Vivaldi. The Venetian church was an unusual institution. In convents, many of the young women did not take vows. Concerts and parties drew young men in search of pleasure. Receptions in the convent parlor were popular social events. The dress and behavior of the supposedly cloistered young women amazed such visitors to Venice as the Englishman Edward Wright. On their feast days, the doors of their convent is flung open and they stand in crowds at the entrance where I have observed them, talking to their acquaintances with great freedom. The convent of San Lorenzo was an important center of music and spectacle in Vivaldi's day. Many of the nuns were of noble families, perhaps sent here to avoid unfortunate marriages or the payment of large dowries. They took their vows in elaborate ceremonies, and Vivaldi wrote this music for just such an occasion in San Lorenzo. More than 50 musicians played for this ceremony, painted by Gabriella Bella. St. Peter's Church was Cathedral of Venice in the 18th century. In 
the chapel of the cathedral in March of 1703 at the age of 25, Vivaldi was ordained a priest. Through his years of study, he had lived at home with his family, and he had not neglected his music. when his first compositions were published, a collection of 12 sonatas, of which this is one. It's being played in the music room of the Ospedaletto, one of four ospedali in Venice. The sonata for three instruments was a popular form in Italy at this time. Vivaldi may have wanted to demonstrate his competence in a traditional manner in his first published works. His sonatas paid homage to the influence of Corelli, the acknowledged master of the form. But they were modern in approach and helped spread the reputation of the young composer priest beyond the watery boundaries of Venice. Ospedales, these extraordinary institutions which so fascinated visitors to Venice, appear in paintings and engravings of the time. Today they no longer care for the orphaned or abandoned girls, of which there were thousands in Vivaldi's Venice. But the buildings still exist, and the marvelous music written for the young women by some of the city's finest musicians has become a part of our heritage. Charles de Brasse of France was one of the prominent visitors who were fascinated by the young women of the Ospedales. They are brought up at the expense of the state, and they are trained only to excel in music. So they sing like angels and play the violin, the flute, the organ, the oboe, the bassoon, the cello. In short, there is no instrument so large that it makes them afraid of it. They are cloistered in the manner of nuns, The Ospedale della Pietà was the best financed and organized of these institutions, and though its role has changed, much of the structure of Vivaldi's time still exists. Shortly after his ordination as a priest in 1703, Vivaldi had the good fortune to be appointed violin teacher at La Pietà. How he obtained the post is not known. It's probable that, as his father expected, being a priest helped open the door to Antonio. For almost 40 years, Vivaldi was associated with the Ospedale della Pietà. 
He was poorly paid. The demands made of him were heavy. He was required to train the girls of La Pieta and present new works constantly. Under Vivaldi, La Pieta was probably the best conservatory of music in Europe, and it provided an ideal environment in which he could develop and perfect his musical ideas. He raised to new heights the art of instrumentation. It was as if he had invented new colors for the orchestra, making music much more expressive and sensual. Some scholars consider Vivaldi's music the most triumphant expression of the Baroque style, while others consider that it marks the beginning of the classic period. Basta, basta. Bene, bene. Adagio spiccato. Sulle corone, più piano, perché suona le due cadenze. Spiccato, due cadenze. Lucetta suonerà la terza. The girls of La Pieta were superb musicians, and the best of them became stars in their own right. Vivaldi wrote concertos for instruments seldom heard in solo roles before. But it was with the strings that Vivaldi's genius was most evident. Today, the Church of La Pieta stands beside the site of the original building so familiar to Vivaldi. It was completed just after his death. Vivaldi composed much church music. Most of it has been lost, but visitors to Venice, such as the Englishman Edward Wright, have described how it was performed. Every Sunday and holiday, there is a performance of music in the chapels of these hospitals, vocal and instrumental, performed by the young women of the place, who are set in a gallery above and are hid from any distinct view of those below by a lattice of ironwork. The organ parts, as well as those of other instruments, are all performed by the young women. As in all the hospitales of Venice, music was a principal part of religious ceremony here. The architect Masari designed it for that purpose, encircling the nave with galleries from which the young musicians performed. Visitors to Venice noted that it was good music rather than devotion that drew crowds of Venetians to the churches. From behind the iron grills, the music of the young nuns poured into the church. Within the hospitales, and sometimes elsewhere, secular concerts were often presented by the young women. Francesco Guardi depicted a gala concert in honor of visiting royalty. Charles de Brosse of France took particular delight in such concerts at La Pieta. The one of the four hospitales I visit most often, and where I enjoy myself the most, is the Ospedale della Pieta. It also ranks first for the perfection of the symphonies. What strictness of execution. It is only there that one hears the first attack of the bow, so falsely vaunted at the Paris Opera. of young women of La Pieta was probably, under Vivaldi, one of the best orchestras in the world. And his new compositions were spreading his fame far beyond Venice. In 1711, the Amsterdam publisher Roger brought out Vivaldi's Opus 3, 
called L'Estro Armonico, a collection of 12 concertos of which we are hearing the 11. His originality caused a sensation throughout Europe. He was, in fact, the first great composer of concertos for solo instrument. Concerts at La Pietà were enormously popular, and the Venetians flocked to them. For audiences today, Vivaldi's works are as appealing as when he wrote them for the young women of La Pietà more than 250 years ago. Shortly after the publication of Opus 3, the Red Priest began a new career. Vivaldi became a composer and producer of operas, and on opening night, he often directed the orchestra himself. loved opera, and they could see and hear it in seven theaters in the Venice of Vivaldi's time. It was in Venice that opera was first available to anyone who could afford a ticket. No longer was it reserved for the nobility. both sides of the curtain, operas were very different from what we know today. They were very long. People were attentive only to those parts which particularly interested them. Visitors were amazed by Venetian opera productions, but often shocked by the behavior of audiences. They have a scandalous custom there of spitting from the upper boxes, as well as throwing the pairings of apples and oranges onto the company in the pit, which they do at random without any concern for where it falls. <laughs> this sign over a small square is all that remains to tell us that here on the Grand Canal was located the Sant'Angelo Theater, in which many of Vivaldi's operas were first presented. 18th century prints show where the theater was located and what it looked like. For years, Vivaldi produced many of his own operas here. 
One appreciative fan of Venetian opera in 1715 was a German merchant and amateur musician named Johann von Uffenbach. I went with some acquaintances to the San Angelo Theater, whose impresario was the famous Vivaldi, who also composed the opera. A very pretty opera, and uh, very attractive to the eye. As impresario, backing his operas with his own money, Vivaldi couldn't hope to escape the odor of scandal attached to opera. He was a central target of a book by Marcello attacking many of the conventions of opera. Words were often considered more important than music in 18th century opera. As a young playwright, Carlo Galdoni, later one of Italy's most revered names in theater, was sent to Vivaldi's house on the Grand Canal to work with the composer at revising an opera. That year, the role of the prima donna was to be taken by a signorina Anina Giro, daughter of a wig maker of French origin, who was commonly called Anina of the Red Priest, because she was Vivaldi's, Vivaldi's um, pupil. She did not have a beautiful voice. Uh, she was not a great musician, but she was pretty and attractive. She acted well, <laughs> a rare thing in those days. And she had protectors. One needs nothing more to deserve the role of prima donna. Many years later, Goldone recalled that first experience of working with Vivaldi. It is one of the very few records of a direct meeting with the composer that has come down to us. Vivaldi needed a poet to arrange or disarrange, a drama to his taste by adapting to it several arias that his pupil Anna Giro had sung on other occasions. But uh, he received me rather coldly. Quite correctly, he took me for a beginner. And finding me ill-versed in the art of mutilating dramas, it was soon clear he wanted to send me away. But I was ambitious. So I concealed my emotions and almost begged the Red Priest to try me out. He fixed upon me a compassionate smile and took up a little book. Here you are, he said. This is the drama to be adapted, Griselda by Apostolo Zeno. It is a very fine work. The role of the leading lady could not be better, but certain changes are needed. If you, sir, knew the rules, but uh, then how could you know them? You see, here, for example, after this tender scene, there is a cantable aria. But as Signora Anna does not like uh, this sort of aria, in other words, she was incapable of singing it, what is needed is an action aria, one that expresses passion without at the same time being pathetic or cantabile. I understand, I replied. I will endeavor to satisfy you. Please give me a libretto. But I need it myself, replied Vivaldi. I have not yet finished with the recitatives. When will you return it to me? Immediately, I said. Uh, give me a pen and a piece of paper. What? Do you think an aria and an opera is like one in an intermezzo? I became angry and replied a bit insolently. He gave me the pen and took a letter from his pocket, from which he tore a sheet of white paper. Don't get angry, he said. Please sit here at this desk. Here's the pen, the paper, and the libretto. Please take your time. Then he retired to his work table and began to recite from his breviary. I then read the scene carefully. I analyzed the sentiment of the cantabile area and turned it into another of action, passion, and movement. I took my work to him. And with uh, his breviary in his right hand and my sheet of paper in his left, he began to read quietly. When he had finished, he threw the breviary into a corner, stood up, embraced me, ran to the door, called Signorina Anina. Anina arrived with Paulina, the sister. He read them the arietta crying, he did it here, he did it here, right here. Again, he embraced me and congratulated me. And now I became his friend, his poet, his confidant, and he never abandoned me. I went on to murder Zeno's drama exactly as he wished. The opera was performed and met with great success. Orlando Furioso was one of Vivaldi's finest operas. 
he first presented it in the San Angelo Theater in 1727. Anna Giro sang the role of the evil Alcina.
It's surprising to find opera occupied so much of Vivaldi's career. More surprises may await those who probe the mysteries of the life and music of the Red Priest, Antonio Vivaldi. A creation of color and light. Venice is an unreal city whose thousand-year history hides many mysteries. Among them is the life of one of our great composers, Antonio Vivaldi. century Venice was flooded with music. Venetia sought out every opportunity to hear it. So did visitors such as Charles de Brosse of France in 1739. It's not that I lack music. There is hardly an evening when there is not a musical performance somewhere. The people rush along the canal to hear it with as much ardor as if it were for the first time. The infatuation of the nation for music is inconceivable. For many visitors to the city on the lagoon, a highlight was hearing Antonio Vivaldi play his violin. Known as the Red Priest for the color of his hair, some said he played like the devil himself. Johann Friedrich von Uffenbach, member of a wealthy Frankfurt family. Vivaldi played a solo accompaniment, splendid, to which he appended a cadenza which really frightened me. For such playing is impossible. He brought his fingers to within a hair's breadth of the bridge, leaving no room for the bow, and he did that on all four strings at an incredible speed. With that, he astonished everyone. But I cannot say that it really charmed me, because uh, while it was very skillfully executed, it was not really all that pleasant to listen to. Though we know Vivaldi as a composer, in his lifetime, he was celebrated as a virtuoso violinist. He played for visiting kings, princes, and ambassadors, and enthralled many a glittering gathering in the palaces of Venice.
Vivaldi was nearing the end of his life when Charles de Brosse, president of the Parliament of Burgundy, visited Venice. He wrote some of the few observations about Vivaldi that have been found. He is an old man who composes furiously, turning out vast amounts of music. I've heard him claim to be able to compose a concerto with all its parts, faster than a copist can copy it. Vivaldi made his living composing and performing music. In some aspects of his work, he was a highly commercial artist, actively promoting the sale of his music to visitors, like Johann von Uffenbach. This afternoon, Vivaldi came to me and uh, brought me, as requested, ten concetti grossi, which he claimed to have written especially for me. I bought some of them, and in order that I might have a better idea of them, he wanted to teach me to play them on the spot and to visit me every so often so that this occasion would be just the beginning. Vivaldi has become one of my intimate friends so as to sell me some very expensive concertos. He has in part succeeded and so have I in that what I particularly wanted was to hear him and have some good musical recreation. This caricature, sketched in Rome in 1723, is the only representation of Vivaldi known for certain to have been made during his lifetime. We can only know him by his music, and that would astonish Vivaldi, because like most composers of his day, he would have had no concept of future fame. He wrote music for his time, a concerto for a concert at La Pieta, a mass for St. Mark's Cathedral, some operas for this year's Carnival. Once performed, the music became public property, and he had to keep composing to earn a living. In his lifetime, he produced more than 500 concertos and symphonies, more than 90 operas, and many sacred works. Just a few short years after his death, it was all forgotten, this extraordinary man and almost all of his music. In 1926, the College of San Carlo, not far from Turin, was in need of repairs. To raise money, a collection of old books of music in the college library was to be sold. Professor Alberto Gentili discovered that a great many of them were handwritten manuscripts by Antonio Vivaldi. He persuaded a Turin businessman to buy the collection for the National Library in Turin as a memorial to a young son who had recently died. The manuscripts had been collected by Count Giacomo Durazzo a few years after Vivaldi's death, but it's not known how he acquired them. Numbers on the volumes indicated that some were missing. They were eventually found in another branch of the Durazzo family and added to the collection in 1930. Hundreds of Vivaldi's works were now assembled in one place. The art of 18th century Venice combines with the music of Vivaldi to help us feel something of the extraordinary nature of the era in which Vivaldi lived. The real and the imaginary are almost indistinguishable in these frescoes by Gian Battista Tiepolo. So it was with life, superficial gaiety disguised harsh realities, 
Life was a play, with Venice the stage upon which Venetians were actors, playing out their roles in spite of impending catastrophe. Illusion and appearance was everything. Masks provided anonymity, helped people avoid responsibility. While much of the nobility lived only for pleasure, misery was the lot of the majority. All classes joined in the celebrations that absorbed half the year. Carnival was the most important of the festivals. Since it was the high season for opera, it was a period of frantic activity for Vivaldi as composer, producer, and impresario of operas. This period, often described as decadent, was richly productive in all the arts. Venetians were inveterate gamblers, and sometimes families were ruined at games in which palaces might change hands at the turn of a card. Venice was the Monte Carlo of the time, its high stakes drawing rich players from across Europe. They often met in a ridotto, the type of gambling salon depicted here by Francesco Guardi.
Antonio Vivaldi was a priest. He had been destined to that vocation by his father when he was 15, and at the age of 25, he was ordained. But only one year later, he decided never again to celebrate Mass. Why? His own explanation we have in a letter written near the end of his life to the Marchese Guido Bentivoglio. For 25 years, I have not said Mass, nor will I ever say it, not because of any order, but by my own decision. For a year or more after being ordained a priest, I said Mass, but I stopped doing so because my illness forced me to leave the altar three times without finishing the celebration. Yet a doubt remains. Could a man who carried on several demanding careers throughout his life really have been that weak? Some suggest that his real devotion was to music and that he allowed nothing to take him from it. Vivaldi wore the habit of a priest throughout his life but the nature of his religious vocation remains a mystery. of Venice grew incredibly rich during the medieval centuries. It was master of most of the Mediterranean and controlled much of European trade. Its wealth was expressed in art, architecture, painting, music. As its wealth and power grew, Renaissance Venetians built sumptuous villas on the mainland. The man-made and natural beauty that surrounded them profoundly influenced the music of Vivaldi and his contemporaries. The government of the Republic encouraged Venetians in their obsessive pursuit of pleasure. It was preferred that citizens not reflect too much on the operations of the ruling oligarchy, in which only the nobility were permitted a voice. Though the Republic has not existed for 200 years, 
its magnificent trappings endure. Paintings of the ceremonies once so common here evoke echoes of long-lost power. Government institutions developed in the Middle Ages were maintained by fear. Anonymous condemnations could be placed in special lion's mouth receptacles. If investigation supported the charges, punishments were swift and severe. This environment of fear can be sensed in an incident involving Vivaldi, recounted by his friend, the German violinist Johann Pisandel. One day, Don Vivaldi and I were walking in St. Mark's Square, when abruptly he interrupted our discussion and instructed me to follow him. So, we quickly walked around behind the Basilica and in a few minutes were inside his house. When we were alone, Vivaldi asked me if I had said or done anything forbidden by the authorities. I was dumbfounded by his question, and I told him that any such suggestion was ridiculous. Vivaldi then explained to me that he had spotted four constables following me as we crossed St. Mark's Square. Of course, I was very worried about what it might mean. So Don Antonio made discreet inquiries of one of the inquisitors and learned that they were looking not for me, but for someone else who looked like me. <laughs> Venice was in the sunset of its 1,000 years of glory. Though most Venetians seemed not to care, some artists, including it seems Vivaldi, tried to awaken the patriotism of their fellow citizens. To celebrate the Republic's last and illusory victory at Corfu against the Turks in 1716, Vivaldi composed and performed a stirring nationalistic oratorio. Judatha Triumphans. Mantua in northern Italy. Vivaldi lived here for three years, from 1718 to 1720. He had been appointed court musician to the Prince of Hesse-Darmstadt, at the time ruling in Mantua. 
Many aspects of the city have changed little since then. Vivaldi's renown was no longer limited to Venice. The sensation created by the publication of his Opus 3 in 1711 had caused his fame to spread across Europe. It was in Mantua that Vivaldi met the young singer Anna Giro, who for the rest of his life was his pupil, his preferred operatic prima donna, and along with her sister Paola, his constant companion in his trips throughout Europe. Roads were rough and often unsafe. Inns were rudimentary and the food usually bad. A Venetian had to cross the Alps to reach the cities of Europe, while the Apennine Mountains made trips to Rome, Naples, or Florence very difficult. Few details of Vivaldi's travels have been found, but it is known that he spent three opera seasons in Rome, where he was a great success and was received by the Pope. It's probable that he visited Dresden and Prague, and it is known that he traveled later in his life to Amsterdam and Vienna. Anna became known as Anina del Prete Rosso, the Red Priest's little Anna. Even in those days, it was inevitable that their relationship would be touched by scandal. It contributed to one of the darkest moments of his life. Vivaldi produced operas in Ferrara, a beautiful and historic city not far from Venice. He stayed at the Palazzo Matsuki. Matsuki was an official of the powerful Marchese Guido Bentivoglio. Bentivoglio and Vivaldi had known each other in Rome when Vivaldi was producing operas there almost 15 years earlier. Apart from some formal musical dedications, the only documents written by Vivaldi known to have survived these two and a half centuries are a few letters to the Marchese Bentivoglio written between 1736 and 1739. They provide details of events that Vivaldi considered disastrous to his career, and they reveal to us a little of the composer's character. Vivaldi was planning an important season of opera for us here in Ferrara. He wrote to me from Verona where his opera Catoni in Utica was enjoying a great success. Here, God be praised, my opera is reaching the stars. There is nothing which is not pleasing the audiences, including the musicians and the dancers. But while Vivaldi was engaging singers, dancers, and musicians for the Ferrara season, the complicated politics of church and state were grinding in a different direction. Ferrara was part of the Papal States, and it was ruled by Cardinal Tommaso Ruffo. Ruffo rebuilt the great cathedral of Ferrara and constructed for himself a magnificent new palace. He sent a message to Vivaldi in Venice. Vivaldi had been about to leave for Ferrara. In great anguish, he wrote to Bentivoglio. After so much exertion and hard work, the opera at Ferrara is wrecked. Today, the apostolic nuncio summoned me and ordered me in the name of his eminence, Cardinal Ruffo, not to go to Ferrara to mount the opera. The reason given is that though I am a priest, I do not celebrate Mass, and that I have the friendship of the singer Anna Giraud. After such a blow, Your Excellency can imagine the state I am in. 
In addition to his specific objections to Vivaldi, Cardinal Ruffo had decided that the dubious world of opera was no place for priests. Bentivoglio appealed to him, but Ruffo said he wouldn't reconsider even if the Pope himself ordered him to do so. Vivaldi wouldn't hear of the possibility of replacing himself with another impresario. He wrote me, The opera is not possible without Anna Giraud, because another such prima donna cannot be found. And the opera can't be done without me, because I will not entrust such a large investment to someone else. And so there was no opera season that year in Ferrara. For Vivaldi, it was a catastrophe. But it provides us this written record, including Vivaldi's own statement that he composed 94 operas. These letters give us a precious glimpse of Vivaldi that we would not otherwise have. Shortly after the Ferrara debacle, Vivaldi was invited to direct the music for an extravagant concert in Amsterdam. But even as his fame continued to grow in Europe, Charles de Brosse could see that his star was fading in Venice. I have found, to my great astonishment, that he is not as highly regarded as he should be in this country, where fashion is everything, where they have been hearing his works for a long time, and where last year's music is considered out of date. March 21st, 1740, Vivaldi's last spring in Venice. He is still sought out by visitors to the city, and on this day he directed his last great concert at La Pietà. For 30 years, he had composed much of his best music for this institution for orphaned and abandoned girls. The young women were to play for Frederick Christian, Elector of Saxony.
time of the royal concert, Vivaldi may already have been planning to leave Venice. In August, he sold a number of concertos to La Pieta for a very low fee and left the city on the lagoon forever. Why did he leave? No one knows. He left hurriedly without canceling the lease on his house. He may have been exiled or considered himself in danger of exile for his ideas of political freedom expressed in such operas as Cotone in Utica. Perhaps he tired of trying to please the fickle Venetian public. Or he may have been seeking the patronage in Vienna of the Emperor Charles VI, who had long appreciated his music. The Emperor died before Vivaldi arrived in Vienna, but the composer stayed on in the city. He died there about a year later. A receipt from the sale of some concertos has been found. The only other record of Vivaldi in Vienna is the bill of expenses for his pauper's funeral, July 28, 1741. The brief peal of bells reserved for the poor would have attracted little attention that summer day in the great capital. Vivaldi's music today is an astonishing phenomenon, considering that it's only since the early 1950s that his music began to be generally known. It is superbly adapted to modern stereo, and the long playing record was probably a crucial factor in the rapid popularizing of his music. But first, the music had to be performed and recorded, and for that, printed music was needed. Just after the war, a young Italian, Antonio Fana, with Angelo Efrician, formed the Istituto Italiano Antonio Vivaldi. They persuaded a publisher, Ricordi, to print the entire works of Vivaldi, a formidable task, for there are about 750 of them. Vivaldi is now part of the repertoire of every good orchestra, and his music is played by artists of world renown, such as Ida Hendel. Antonio Vivaldi speaks to us across the centuries through his music. 
This red-haired priest, declining to say mass, fighting his way through the glittering world of 18th century Venice, composed some of his finest music for his city's crown jewel, St. Mark's Cathedral. For centuries, this church and its ceremonies have inspired great art. In the tradition of the Gabrielis in Monteverdi, Antonio Vivaldi created works like his Gloria for celebrations in this incredible building. No! 